Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion Summit as a part of Spark Animation Festival, brought to you for the second year on behalf of WIA, which is Women in Animation. Um, women in Animation is the only organization dedicated to advancing women in the field of animation. And as the popularity of animation has grown and now is reaching audiences of diverse age, gender, ethnicity, and culture, um, and as this growth continues, we need to ensure that animation content represents the world as it should be as a way to move the culture forward. So our Diversity and Inclusion Summit is about connection and community, and our panel today, which I'm really excited about, uh, is about widening our lens. So it's about bringing focused discussion on personal experiences from diverse talent and active allies in the entertainment industry. I'm happy to introduce myself. My name is Alka Dumont. My pronouns are she and her, and I've been a senior implementation manager at Electronic Arts for the past four years. I work in operations mainly, um, working directly with marketing and creative teams. We're here to do and make the work of the day-to-day -day operations of these incredibly talented uh, teams more efficient. Uh, and I'm moderating today's panel because I'm heavily involved in the DEI work at EA. DEI stands for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, I've held positions on our boards from our Women's ERG and Aspire, which is our Asian and Pacific Islander ERG. And I believe, um, and to quote one of my favorites, if, if you've never heard of Minda Hartz, I highly recommend go check her out. And she's got two amazing books, but she says, um, we all have a voice and we have to decide how we want to use it. And so as a South Asian woman in an industry like gaming um, and the more creative side of uh, gaming, I should say, I'm definitely steeped in privilege and I'd want to use my voice specifically to facilitate and advocate for conversations exactly like this. Um, so before I get started and introduce our incredible panel, I do want to take a moment on behalf of WIA to acknowledge and recognize there is a bit of a gap in representation and lived experiences from the full spectrum of LGBTQIA plus community on our panel today. Um, I do want everyone to know that WIA sought and, and tried really hard to get as much representation as possible. And if you're in the audience and in the future want to volunteer and share your voice to an event like this um, or to the organization as a whole, uh, please reach out to your local WIA chapter. And we just wanted to be open about that uh, ahead of our conversation, just out of respect and solidarity for the entire spectrum of the community. And of course, it doesn't take away from our deep gratitude for those who are lending their time and joining us today. And I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the introductions. I feel like I've talked too much. The whole point of this is to facilitate the conversation with this incredible panel. We have two members of the LGBTQIA plus community, Ty Coyne and, uh, Cole, sorry, and Sarah Martin, who's gonna be, who will be speaking about their unique journey, as well as Jillian Brooks, who is passionate uh, to show up as an ally in all spaces. So welcome everyone. Uh, let me go ahead and get started with uh, some introductory information, some bio information. So Ty um, is a global animations and visual effects technical recruiter. He's also a senior character animation artist with over eight years of experience where he's worked on national commercials and well-known live action feature films. Definitely Google him. His work is great. I saw some of the short uh, films and commercial work that he's done, and it's incredible. Um, Sarah Martin is a facility ma facilities manager at a local animation studio and is especially passionate about queer safety in and out of the workplace. She aims to use her extensive experience to help our workplaces become safer for queer people and all people in general. And then Jillian Brooks an active ally of the LGBTQIA plus community who is passionate about joining the panel and a department manager in the industry, an artist who's worked in gaming and visual effects for over 15 years. Her project, Métis Bannock Queen, raises funds for nonprofits in Vancouver. So welcome to everybody. I will go ahead and get started and direct a question to you, Ty. Um, you have amazing experience. What advice would you have for anyone getting into the industry and staying there? Uh, that's a great question. And I'd first like to say thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, I really have just one word for that, and that's proactive. Being proactive, period. 
Um, I remember being back in school. Uh, it's very intimidating, especially being in an art school surrounded by such talented artists. It can feel a bit competitive and that can sometimes um, uh, be distracting when you're trying to uh, focus on yourself and uh, push yourself forward. Um, so I recommend being proactive, especially on LinkedIn, um, because you just don't know what doors could open merely by just saying hello or asking for advice or even looking for mentorship. Um, and on top of that, um, I'd say that the first step is better than delaying it. So, you know, fear can definitely hold us back from putting our name out there, especially because as artists, you know, we sometimes are driven by ego and we uh, can be afraid if we think our artwork is good enough or not. And um, my one tip is to just put it out there, start the journey, start getting uh, your work in front of recruiters and, and other artists, because again, you just don't know what doors could potentially open. Um, and in terms of uh, staying in the industry, one thing I do want to bring up is that burnout can happen. And I think it's also very important to be able to discover uh, other interests that you might have, um, because as artists, you know, we get to do what we love every day, but at the same time, you know, if at least for me, when I was animating all day, every day, the last thing I wanted to do when I came home was animate some more. So I went on this separate journey where I had to discover my own identity outside my artwork, which was quite difficult at first, um, and find other interests and in, in passions and other hobbies. Um, so yeah. I love that answer. And it's so critical to think about what are your what are the things that drive your passion outside of your day-to-day -day work so that you're preventing that burnout and, and you can stay in it longer. Um, let's move to you, Sarah. Uh, in your experience, what would you say is something, uh, is a change that has made a significant positive impact in the workplace um, and our industry? Uh, that is also a great question, and I do want to take the time to thank you all for having us today. I feel really privileged and honored to be in this space. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of great changes that have come. And I would say, <clears throat> just to think of one that is happening right now that I'm seeing a lot is the use of pronouns as an industry standard. Um, I don't know, my Zoom keeps kicking my pronouns out of here, which is hilarious and ironic. I use she, her pronouns. Um, but yeah, just having pronouns and pronoun education and people getting that experience from, you know, every industry or every uh, workplace is different, but getting that experience at the beginning and just really opening up to the needs of the 2SLGBTQ plus community has been really, I, I've seen, I've been in the industry for now 10 years and I've seen such a huge shift from it not being addressed at all to now it is becoming slowly the industry standard. I think that we're at a place now where people are like, if, if you don't have that kind of education in your workplace, it, it's something that people are, it's right on the next thing that they're going to be learning about. So I, I'm really, excited about that and you know that people can come and show up and that people every day are learning whether or not they're um, you know from the queer community or not especially people who aren't they're getting that edu education from you know the first moment of contact with recruitment and they're learning about um, the culture just from that question so that's a huge change that I've seen. It's an incredible change and we've had the same sort of over the last year at Electronic Arts, a lot more conversation about pronouns, pronoun usage. I actually just looked right now because normally it is saved into my default setting, but I think because this is an external Zoom, um, it's, it's kind of lost. But um, normally I have my pronouns there quite prominent and there's been a lot of education internally that even if you are not a part of that community to have your pronouns there, signals a safe space for other people whose pronouns are um, things that are very important to them and, and a part of their identity and something that is a really wonderful way to create safe spaces and again an example of how you can use your privilege 
to open up spaces and make things uh, to make it more comfortable for other people. Um, I do want to call out something before I talk to you, Jillian, and ask you the first question. I do want to call out something that came up in the chat. I do want to apologize sincerely for not mentioning the Two Spirit community um, and and calling out the full acronym 2S LGBTQIA+. So deepest apologies there. Uh, wasn't intended. So thank you for calling us uh, calling that out and educating anyone else in the audience who wasn't aware that that was the full acronym. Um, so Jillian, on to you. I'd uh, love to ask you a question of uh, what ways do you think that the industry or companies in general have evolved to be more inclusive and in what ways do you think that they could be better? Yeah, definitely. I just wanted to say thank you all for having me here. I'm, I'm Métis First Nations and it's really important to have Indigenous and also be an ally for all the communities that are involved. So thank you. Um, I think what's been really amazing is a lot of HR um, firms now are coming into companies and promoting um, onboarding for LGBTQT plus two-spirited community, also including um, the truth and reconciliation for indigenous communities. So when people from all over the globe are coming into companies, they're getting that education and that understanding. And even in email aliases now, it's, uh, it's a standard in some studios in Vancouver where you have the pronouns in your email heading, which I think is really important because, you know, when you have that um, acceptance for everybody, then, you know, you're starting dialogues, which will help everybody uh, be more understanding in long terms, which I think is so important, especially um, for people that are like discovering who they are in the communities. And, you know, when they see that everybody else, this is normal, right? This isn't just, you know, growing up, I came from a really small town where, you know, you just don't talk about those kind of things. And, you know, you just have to hide that part of yourself. And that's really unfortunate. Um, my sister is two-spirited Métis, and I've been learning a lot from her and, and her journey as well. So I, I think it's just important that more companies uh, set the standard for what we're doing globally. And in Vancouver, especially, I've been seeing a lot of it. And it's really amazing, honestly, as like a local community to see all the growth internally that's happening. I mean, we spend so much time in the workplace and it's it's great to see some companies going through the effort of education and normalizing certain um, uh, practices like using pronouns and like participating in ERG events. Um, I would love to see it go be more, even more intentional and to have more resources and funding behind it. Um, mm -hmm. It is the starting point though. Yeah, and it's good that some companies are starting to, and they're starting that dialogue. Um, when I was at Dina before, I'm currently at Scanline, um, we had a woman from um, Treaty 6 come and do a beautiful truth and reconciliation talk, and it was it was really powerful and moving, and, and I hope that more companies start to do that, rely on uh, other members of the community to come forward and, you know, talk about their truths and trials and tribulations that they've gone through because it just makes everything more accepting down the line right absolutely being able to like bring your true like authentic self to work is it can be tough for some people yeah, really. um and creating a safe space creating an environment where you feel like people want to know more about you are interested in in having a good faith conversation with you about um who you are where you come from and your culture is 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 really special and some workplaces really lean into that a lot more uh, but speaking of like authenticity and, and bringing your authentic self to work ty i would love to ask you um, in what ways do you feel like you've been able to bring who you are to work sure so i have two parts to that question one from the animator side and the other from the recruitment side so uh in terms of the animation side i find myself uh really connecting with and gravitating towards more uh, feminine characters. It's just something I've always kind of understood a bit more. Um, and I've always enjoyed animating them way more than <laughs> any other type of character. And um, that's been really like, for instance, like this, like I do poses uh, that are inspired by um, the Wallace and Gromit series where they're super over the top and like, especially like pushed um, and exaggerated. Um, and in terms of the recruitment side, um, 
being an artist myself, uh, it's made it much easier to communicate when hiring for certain roles because I understand the jargon and the lingo that a lot of the artists use. Um, so I've been really able to connect with a lot of the different um, roles and what the artists are referring to and the conversation can flow a lot more naturally, uh, say over the phone or via a Zoom call. Yeah, that's great. That's actually really interesting um, in terms of like being able to bring who you are to work and like having that inform and be a part of your art as well. Um, Sarah, I would love to ask you, um, in what ways do you think other people can show up in allyship and, and what is a, a way that they can do that that's meaningful? I think that is a great question and I think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think when it comes to allyship in any in any marginalized group, it starts with the people who are not part of that group. Um, if you're somebody who is part of our community and you show up to workplace time and time again and systems are not put in place or haven't been thought of for you, you know, let's uh, carry the conversation from pronouns, gender neutral washrooms, forms that people are filling out and benefits. Um, those are some really big barriers that queer people, especially trans people face when coming into the workplace. So if you're somebody who is not part of our group, please talk to your HR, talk to your benefits company, ask, you know, call your benefits company and ask why there aren't more uh, gender identity options. It's really, really tiring when folks have to go from studio to studio to studio in our industry and have to keep asking for the same things over and over. It can kind of make that person appear to be problematic because they're speaking up about their needs constantly. So it's a really big burden to carry. And if you are someone who does identify yourself as an ally, um, just remember that allyship is ongoing and it's something that you have to continue to do. Um, you know, you're learning, we're learning, we're all learning together. We're gonna mess up. We're not gonna do things perfectly and to just keep going and don't get discouraged by doing the wrong thing and take the burden off of the people who you're learning from and put it back on yourself. Um, you know, we are living in an age, I know this is, you know, it is kind of become a tagline that sounds rude, but Google is free and we all have access to it. And we are in a time where information is at our fingertips and there are tons of folks who have put in a lot of good work on the internet to talk about these issues. And so, yeah, I would just say the number one thing that people can do uh, is, is do the work themselves if they want to be considered an ally. I love that answer. Google is free for sure. Um, I, I, I love this idea of, um, taking the burden away from marginalized people, they are, are already trying to deal with the stress and the pressure of, you know, whatever they're dealing with as the marginalized group and not having access to the things that they actually need in order to be good, to be productive and members of their, their workplace, to be members, uh, productive members of their community. And um, if you come from a place of privilege and you want to be a good ally, it's no longer about like, just the passive levels of allyship where you just kind of know these things or, or read a book or watch a video. This is more about like, how can you actively do something to be, um, we, I hear the term used in the community of like being an accomplice as opposed to being an ally. So something I, I, I love that in the, I know in the workplace here, it's such a big, um, this is such a big company and a lot of times people just don't know where to get started. And I often give people the advice of, ERG meetings or community meetings exist, don't single out someone and ask them questions and ask them to get you up to speed on what's going on in that particular community. Go to a meeting, go attend the sessions that are available, to go to the fireside chats um, if they're available. If none of those things are available in your immediate space, then yes, go to Google and watch some videos, watch some lectures, some TED Talks, anything to get you up to speed on what that community is is in most need of in that particular moment and then use your voice on on their behalf ask the questions of 
a human resources or people experience. Ask the questions of your senior managers or your executives about things that are very important to that particular group, whether it's representation in like executive suite, um, if it's, uh, it's representation in leadership roles, if it's um, gender neutral bathrooms, if it's uses of pronouns, is if, it, if it's funding to create uh, ERG groups or diversity groups, um, use your voice to start asking the questions and saying like, why don't we have that? Um, even if you're not a member of that community because you're using your voice, you're helping those because I can guarantee the people in those communities are using their voices and they're not being heard or they've used their voice so much and they've kind of, they've gotten a little tired of continuing to ask the same questions, so. Exactly, it's about the amplification, right? Yes, I love that word, amplification. Um, that's exactly what it is. You've got the power, your voice has a lot of power. And on that note, I know I kind of like went off on a tangent there, but um, I was really fired up by your, your comment, Sarah. And Jillian, let's ask um, the next question for you is if you have an allyship story that comes to mind, it kind of goes, flows with the conversation we were just having, uh, but an allyship story that uh, you think others could learn from. Yeah, um, we, um, the, my last company that I worked at, we have a lot of people um, that are trans. And so there was a few people that I worked with that didn't know how to, you know, give pronouns and I said just reach out to this individual I'm like there's no harm in asking right but also the great thing about having the onboard is that all that information is filled out to begin with so I think it's really important to reiterate that companies need to have that they need to have those things set up so it doesn't become this awkward situation you can just look on a wiki and then you can see but also yet again, it's, it's to re reiterate what Sarah said, people need to do their own research and their history. Google is free. All these things are out there. They've been around forever. And I feel like we're at a point now where it's just, it's, it's like an excuse now, or it's just people's lack of knowledge or not wanting to know. And it's really upsetting to any community or any individual who feels like they're not being heard. So. Um, yeah, I, I spoke with this individual. I knew ahead of time what the pronouns were. So I just explained to a few other of my other coworkers that, you know, this person likes to be identified as they, them, and they are an amazing um, artist. And, you know, from that on, you can get to know them better and then and support them and ask what their needs are as being a trans person, especially like brand new to the industry, right? So there's a lot of people that are coming in, especially from schools now, um, and it's a new generation, right? So I, especially in my age category, there's a lot of people that just, you know, they just don't want to put the effort in. And so it's really unfortunate. So I'm happy that some companies are now starting to, but I think it should be everywhere now. I think if your company is not doing that, you should be demanding it. You should be expecting that they have some sort of setup so people... Uh, feel like they're included in this dialogue and moving forward. Agreed. Uh, in terms of like making sure that you, if there isn't a space available or resources available, to yeah. start asking the questions like, why not? Why isn't it here? Yeah. I think even the act of asking why is a good prompt for the deeper discussions because whatever yeah, answer that is, is going to inform you of the mindset of the, the company. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and like the excuse of not understanding or why is it a big deal? Like that just sets me off. I'm like, it's, it, it's because you're, you're creating this barrier that doesn't need to exist, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if it's like, oh, a uh, lack of understanding, well, then the first step is awareness. Awareness yeah. first building education on top of it and then from there going moving into like actual action where you're looking at the policies of your company the strategies of your your company in terms of things like hiring and retention and and, and looking starting to look under the hood a little bit more about like the mechanics of how things work behind the scenes to see where yeah. change where you can you can promote and and push for change yeah, definitely. And like, I, I even suggested to the last company I was at, like, why don't you guys have a scholarship 
for like indigenous or for queer people and go to schools and give tours to indigenous youth or to people that are in the community. I, I just don't understand why that's not a thing, right? There's so many and like to give early access to someone being like, no matter what you are or what you identify as, there's space for you in this industry and, and to educate and to promote that. I just feel like that should be a standard in our industry. For sure. I mean, we all are coming from different studios and companies of varying sizes, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter the size of the company. It feels like there's at least something that could be done. And mm -hmm. um, there are many resources online of how do you get started? If, if you're a smaller company, like how do you get started of building a more inclusive space in your company, uh, yeah. especially for the last two years, lots of really great resources and articles being written about it. And I would also say, like, the, the existence of WIA, if your company doesn't have something internal, look external. There's there's pockets of community that are super supportive and can give you that guidance um, outside of your internal office. I'd also like to add transparency. You know, like, there's a lot of things that due to whatever limitation that maybe, um, you know, artists or people on the floor aren't aware of, just be transparent about it. Um, for example, our building um, that we are currently occupied, all seven of us, because everybody works from home right now. But, um, you know, when we're all in the studio and there's not a gender neutral change room for the gym, and that is, um, you know, it's, it's not up to us, it's with the building. And, you know, we are constantly talking to the building management and just letting people know that this is something that we're actively working on. And after two and a half years, um, general manager and I got news that they're finally looking into the contractor in this because people have brought it up and it's, we continuously follow up with it. So, you know, as long as you're trying and, and it, there will be movement, even though it feels like there isn't, gives people, um, you know, that, that sense that things are being looked after, even though it doesn't exist yet. Yeah, that's what definitely what progress looks like for sure. Um, Ty, uh, I would love to ask you a, another question. Um, throughout your experience, uh, does a strong example of allyship stand out or a way that you've been able to be a strong advocate for someone else? Sure, yes. Um, back uh, two years ago, um, I had moved to Montreal to work on a feature animated film. And at the time, A, it was a new country, and B, I didn't speak uh, the French language, and C, the every individual that was brought to work on the project was from many different countries of many different backgrounds, uh, speaking many different languages. And so, you know, I was pretty much alone and by myself through the first half of that experience, and there was an individual who uh, was sitting near me. And while we didn't really sh share the same language, we started to like uh, find ways to communicate and learned that we were both, um, uh, we were both gay and we bonded over this, uh, you know, our orientation and we found a companionship through that. Um, and we started sitting next to each other um, and getting to know each other more. And we ended up going and uh, enjoying pride in Montreal together. Um, and while the communication was, you know, it was a struggle sometimes, we found communicating through different ways and through that companionship. And so for me, it was just by merely saying hello. Um, and through there, we found a bond and, you know, we're still in touch. I love that. Like, just I, even after the pandemic, I think it's going to be really interesting what our social skills are <laughs> coming out of two years or so of lockdown. Right. Um, but just saying hi and introducing yourself um, is, is such a powerful way to start a connection and to, to create that connection and support. Being in uh, the animation industry and whether you're freelancing or not, sometimes, at least in the beginning of my career, my social skills weren't the best. Uh, and, you know, we are, we are working on computers all day, so it doesn't lend to that type of environment. But... Um, you know, it's, for me, I, it's highly encouraged to at least just say that one word, which is hello. I love that. That's great. Um, Sarah, how about, um, how about you? So like, it's important to cultivate a circle of support in the industry. Do you have any advice for others when they're developing their own circle of support? 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm an extrovert. So I think that I have a easier time. Extrovert meaning I know how I know how to talk. <laughs> I like talking. Um, but I'm also an introvert in the sense that I, you know, too many talks drain drain me. Um, but I my point is is that I feel at ease talking to people. So, I mean, my experience might be a little bit different than somebody who's, uh, you know, super anxious about that. But really, I think that there's people for you everywhere. And, you know, it takes a little bit of vulnerability on your part. And like Ty was saying, you know, just saying hello. Um, but really, I think that when it comes down to really meaningful relationships and a circle of support in your industry, it's important to be able to be authentic with whoever it is you're talking to in the sense of learning how to have productive conversations. Most of my, uh, the people that are in my circle, we disagree on a lot of things, but we know and have taught ourselves how to have those conversations where we both end up feeling heard or, you know, if there's a group of us, we are all able to feel heard. And it doesn't mean that we've come to some amazing resolution of this is the way forward, but really it's about learning how to have conflict and hard conversations um, without, you know, I, I'm almost 40 now and I, I've learned that you can't just walk away from people, places and things when they get hard. It, it, it takes a lot of uh, resilience and vulnerability to stay in those conversations and have those hard work conversations um, that we need to have in order to get our needs met. So I really think that being honest and being focusing on, yeah, ha having hard conversations and, and conflict is what my advice would be. Yeah, uh, conf conflict and having like conversations like th that are perhaps a little bit more intense in the workplace. It's it's always hard to like figure out the, the right tone to strike that your voice is being heard, but you're not, you know, being completely like dismissive of the other person and finding that balance between the two. And I, I'm still, you know, I've been working for, for at this point decades, but like, I still don't have the right tone on that. Um, oh, I'm with you. I think for neurodivergent <laughs> people, I'm neurodivergent. I think it's a little bit harder for us to judge our tone. I get that I'm blunt a lot, which I totally am, but to me, blunt is efficient. So I, you know, in a professional setting, you have to um, try to navigate that. And that's why you have people who are better than that, than that, than you, right? Because they can, they can guide you a little bit um, on that. It is, I mean, you bring up a really great point, um, bringing up the fact that like when you're neurodivergent, you might not have the exact same social like uh not skills i don't want to use the word skills but like the same social personality as a, of other people you have a different way of of communicating and getting points across um which can be uh, perceived negatively by other people so having i'm imagining that having like a circle of support and having people where you could practice or bounce ideas off of before you have to share them or have conversations with other people is really helpful um, exactly having that support and being able to like practice but um I, I would love to say like two mentors and sponsors um people who can help guide you perhaps are really uh for me in this past year has been really helpful especially in the pandemic of being like really disconnected from other people um and feeling like i need to have a connection point to others that can maybe help guide me and to help me develop my career has been really helpful um so i always have like a network of peers i've always but i've never really had like a really good handle on how to gain mentorship um and i think organizations like I, i've mentioned it before i feel like i'm not getting paid to say this but like we uh and other organizations like that where you can find mentorship outside and it's like an active audience or a group of people that are there for the same thing they want to have that connection they want to make those make those connection points so if you're the kind of person who's maybe more of an introvert and um doesn't know how to approach other people sometimes i feel like going into a pool where everyone is actively wanting to connect the like, same thing yeah well, everyone's seeking the same thing um is a really great way to connect and grab onto other people um uh, because 
that is an audience, a, a group of people that are actively looking to do the exact same thing. So it can ease, I feel like, some of the tension. I know it's really, it's a struggle if you're um, an introvert or if you have, if you're neurodivergent, but that's a, a small piece of advice is go to places where people are actively friendly already. <laughs> totally. And I think too, with the, you know, with the pandemic, of course, we all know all the negative things that have come from that, but the positive things are for neurodivergent people. And of course, everything's a spectrum. So you might have people like me, we're totally okay talking to people, but for other people who aren't, you know, um, the biggest thing is ask, 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 ask there. And don't be afraid of the word no, because that's going to happen tons in your career. But if you ask, and now with like I was saying with the, uh, with us being, you know, in virtual spaces a lot, you can type and it's, it's, you know, viewed as the same as going and walking up to a person. So I think that's a really big benefit for everybody in this industry. Yeah. Our Slack channels, like we use Slack internally as like a messaging platform, but it's such a great way to, take the edge off of having to physically go up to someone or to set a one-on-one -on -one time, you can at least start the conversation in Slack. And um, it's a way to do that, not face-to-face, -face. you can type it out. And in typing things out, you can kind of double check it before you say it um, and not have the issue of like when you say things and you feel like you don't have enough of a filter. Um, so that's a, like a really great point. And I would love to ask like everybody on the panel, like what, what are your thoughts on re-emerging from the pandemic and going back into a more corporate um, sort of environment? Are there things that you will, that you've gained in the pandemic that you want to take into the workspace, whether it be skills or a uh, new attitude or new philosophies that you want to take back to the workplace? Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I think a big one for me, I think we spoke about it earlier, was just the burnout that Ty mentioned. Um, especially in visual effects, it's just such a common thing. You know, we have deadlines, we have crazy clients. Um, people get to the point where it's just, you know, they, they don't want to say no in fear of losing their jobs. And unfortunately, you get into this really like unhealthy cycle where it's just you're going from one project to the next without any time of rest and, and giving your brain and, and your spirit and all of that time to recover. And, and I feel like as an industry now, and as individuals, it's it's better now that people are coming into the office and they're like, actually, you know what, now that I've spent so much time at home, I'm actually going to just spend like maybe half a day in the office and then I'm going to go back home and be with my family. You know, like a, a lot of coworkers have said, you know, I, I get more time with my family and my kids and I could have dinner with my partners and that, you know, was never a thing that happened before you would just, you know, you'd eat at your desk, right? So I think it's, really important that people are standing up for their rights in the office and like what and knowing their limits I think that's a big thing too that's kind of transpired out of the pandemic that's been more positive now because people are realizing hey actually I can't be working like 100 hours a week right <laughs> regardless of deadlines I need to step back and just realize that in myself and my worth matters more than a delivery date so that, that's one thing I've noticed I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And Ty, you had mentioned as well, like the idea of cultivating just interests and things beyond the the day to day of work um, right. to keep you from burning out. Yeah, I was just thinking about that because now that we're, I mean, we're still in the pandemic, and all most of us are still working from home. Um, you know, things beyond just sitting at the desk, things like the gym, things that um, I might have put off for a bit. Definitely keeping that consistency. Um, when we return into the office and again, finding other uh, hobbies and things to get yourself out of the apartment, but keep those, um, those interests and those hobbies up, even when you, you, we leave uh, this current new normal. Um, I think that's very important for a, a healthy, stable mindset um, when, whenever this ends. <laughs> Crossing fingers when it whenever ends. this ends. <laughs> <laughs> who who knows? And it's it's interesting because like we're so close to the end of the year. Um, so I'm hoping I'm hoping that the situation in the next couple of months um, changes. But I know that like the just the pandemic in general has 
changed the way that we are going to live our lives. And so we've all proven some level of adaptive uh, adaptability um, to the situation. And Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's really important to look around and, and see the folks that maybe are struggling with some of that, um, the issues with adapting and coming Mm -hmm. back into the office. I think we're going to have like a moment as we all come back into the workspace of thinking like, okay, well, some of us are struggling with this. So how can we make this better? And I I also hope that, you know, I think a lot of priorities for individuals have shifted um, during this time. I know there's a term floating around the great resignation, Mm -hmm. like everybody are rediscovering what they want to do like their priorities are being uh, refocused and reanalyzed i hope that when we do go back into um the workspace uh things have settled down that we remember that like what we're thinking we remember the reanalyzing that we've been doing uh, so that it's just not lost on us that we've learned from it and we've also grown from it um, and created a healthier overall um work environment yeah, the great resignation um, is is such an interesting trend, uh, and and I'm happy to see it. I mean, it means that people's lives are sort of in flux, which can be scary. Change is scary for everyone, I think, but it also represents that people are setting boundaries for themselves and right. thinking more about like what do they actually want to do. Our, our time, I I think too, the pandemic has thought, made us all think about like the fact that our time on this planet is very limited. Um, So what should we be doing with it in, and how can we make our lives more meaningful? Um, So I give great kudos to those who can and have the resources and the ability to like resign and figure out what they actually want to do. Totally. I think too, something to keep in mind is this big reset for us. Like um, when you're thinking about, you know, there's a lot of like polarizing ideas in what our industry means. Um, You know, people who have been in the industry for 30 plus years versus people who are just coming into it. And like those needs are going to be so different, Um, you know, not just in the queer community, but in all communities. And I think right now we're kind of having that um, moment of going, how can we all exist in spaces together? And what does that look like? Because um, something that I like to say is, you know, in five, 10 years, when Gen Z is fully entering the workforce, so- they're not going to care about pronouns and gender neutral washrooms. That's just going to be the bare minimum, right? So companies right now, um, things that we think are, you know, really making ground, it's just going to be uh, standard and I, I look forward to that day and I think you know younger generation generations are pushing us there quickly and I think that's something really cool. Agreed, agreed. Um, Jillian, uh, this is kind of actually leading into a question we I wanted to ask you about any advice you would have for anyone who's looking to get into the industry as people are changing and, and evolving what they want to do um, in terms of their career and development. Uh, any advice for those who who want to enter this industry? And then something, um, what are some things that have been important to you throughout your career when you're looking for a new opportunity? Yeah, um, I actually started out um, in the game industry. I went to school for it. And um, as my career went on, um, I found that I was just like losing the love for doing modeling and video games. I just found that I personally wanted to keep art for me doing it myself and I didn't like it being critiqued all the time I felt like it just took away from it so but I still wanted to be involved in the creative community so I switched over to production where I could help people grow and manage and and it just felt like a more natural avenue for me to get into but I didn't have any experience in production because I was a modeler and I went to school so I actually started volunteering with SIDGRAPH and that's how I got involved with um, coordinating and management and and helping people um, like organization through the the events and I found that I really enjoyed doing that and then um, uh, when I started applying for jobs that was like the basis for me so like if if you are new to the industry or if you're wanting to look to get into visual effects or in the production avenue volunteering at these events are really good it's a good stepping stone for anybody that's interested. And then you get to meet people that are in the community already. So 
and you get to meet like-minded people. And that was a great avenue for me as well, because I met some of my best friends at some of these events and, and we work together now. So, and, and you create like these beautiful relationships. Um, like Keith earlier, who was in the room, I actually worked with him at Safeway a long, long time ago. And um, we worked together on events through SIGGRAPH. So it's just been, you know, it's like kind of full circle now that I'm speaking at a panel. <laughs> But um, yeah, I feel like if you, like like um, Ty and Sarah said, it's just saying hello and starting that, that dialogue and that conversation and, you know, being a bit vulnerable and putting yourself out there because, you know, like your voice is very powerful. And when you start to go towards what you want to do and what you're passionate about, then, you know, like the sky's the limit, honestly. I love that idea of uh, volunteer and we'd mentioned like joining external organizations like this and community groups like this. But um, if you are someone who is like more of a, an introvert and um, ha you know, you might not feel as comfortable with like just straight going and saying hello to people that you don't mm -hmm. know, sometimes volunteering and saying mm -hmm. and being a part of like creating events, working on art for events that are, are in existence or promoting Absolutely. something are really good ways to be like, focus on the task and you'll get to know people from the ta the work that you're doing on the task. So long as you keep yourself open and like, like you were saying, open and vulnerable as you're working on those things and getting to know the people who are also volunteering as well. It's such a, and it's, you're right. It's beautiful relationships that you're creating of people who are very like-minded, who are very civic minded, community minded. And it's such mm -hmm. a nice way to connect with people in a low stakes environment um, where it's not so much of like the pressure when you're in an office and be like, oh, I'm going to work with this person yeah. for who knows how long I got to have a good relationship with them. There's lots of pressure to it. That's like a really nice low stakes way to get to know other people. And, to yeah, make those relationships. and then like even having like group chats online or Facebook, because like you said, some people are introverted and they, you know, don't feel comfortable approaching others. So having those avenues online for people that, you know, feel like that's a safe space for them. That's, that's so important. And it's great that, you know, a lot of groups have these channels via Instagram or Facebook. And it's, it's good for people, you know, when they are younger, just to start that dialogue through those channels. Absolutely. Uh, we're about at, at time um, to wrap things up, but I wanted to open up for everyone on the panel if there's anything else you want to add to this conversation. We've had a lot of discussion about allyship and uh, the, the work environment and the industry in general, but I'll open the floor if there's anything else you want to add. I just have one thing to say. Um, I just think it's important to realize, like, first of all, these conversations are happening when they weren't, you know, five, 10 years ago, even, even though queer people were, um, or accepted is the quotations I wanted to use. Um, you know, they were accepted, especially in a place like Vancouver, but really seeing that difference and knowing that there's never like a place where we're going to get to where we're like, ah, we're finally here. It's always going to be um, conversations, hard ones, easy ones, um, you know, really figuring out each other's needs. And I think that communication is a huge part of that. Um, I am just really happy to be able to have these conversations with people like you all here on this panel, um, my chosen family, my hard family, all of that. But yeah, I just don't think there's ever a place where we're going to get there. And we're going to all feel like we're loved, accepted and seen by everyone. So I just think that it's an evolution. And I'm just happy to be part of that. While simul simultaneously being angered most of the time. <laughs> let that anger fuel fuel you exactly. right <laughs> to yeah. do good <laughs> that anger is fuel <laughs> well great unless uh, anyone else has anything to add I, i'm gonna give everyone back some time but thank you everyone for listening to this conversation it's going to be the first of many and um looking forward to any of the future conversations that happen and definitely encourage everyone uh, in the audience if you're not already a part of, of wea to definitely sign up but thank you all. Uh, it was great talking to you and have a good remainder of your day. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.